How's everyone feeling after lunch? Carb coma? No, I, I can relate. That's why I was doing some stretches just now. Uh, if anyone wants to stand up and stretch a little bit, I won't object. In fact, I encourage you to do so. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to sharing a bit about how we can rewild Agile. Great. Oana's taking the lead. Leading the change. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wonderful. So I was wondering how I should introduce myself because I am not actually an Agile practitioner, although I did take my certified Scrum Master during the height of the lockdown uh, of, you know, of the pandemic in Singapore. The government gave us, I think, $500 worth of credits on the skills upgrading portal, and I went online and thought and saw just about every listing that was relevant to me had Agile in it. Agile marketing, business agility. Then I saw certified Scrum Master, and I thought, okay, that's normally quite expensive. So if I can get some government money to do it, I will do it. So that is my background into the world of Agile. Although, working at Cognitive Edge with Dave Snowden, we have always been you know, adjacent to Agile, and Kinevin is pretty well diffused into the Agile world by now. And wondering how I should introduce myself, I, I came across this quote in a blog by David Heinemeyer Hansen, who was the founder, he's the founder of Basecamp and 37 Signals, and now he writes a lot. And he wrote quite recently, 9th February, uh, it's also hyperlinked on the slides later, is that it's easier to break the paradigms if you're not enmeshed in them on the daily. And this is very, very important to take note of. This is what in complexity science we call pattern entrainment. Usually when you start in a new field or in a new job, you don't, you, you're so everything is fresh. You're looking at it with fresh eyes, but as you get, as you get entrained into the patterns, the daily routines of work, it becomes more and more difficult to break those patterns. So I wanted to introduce myself with this quote because I'm not an agile practitioner. I don't consider myself an agile practitioner. However, what I've been doing for the past 14, 14 years of my career is to help organizations tackle their complex problems. And by that, we usually mean humans and human interactions. So I'm hoping that what I'll share today will have broad applicability, not just in Agile, if you're an Agile practitioner, but also in general, in the organizations that you work in, and also beyond that, possibly. But what is rewilding? Back to the topic. Rewilding aims to restore healthy ecosystems by creating wild, biodiverse spaces. That applies to ecology, and this slide usually it evokes a few laughs in people when they see it, because on the left you see the ancestors of all the different pictures you see on the right. And I love dogs, but I will say that chihuahuas are not my particular favorite, so apologies to anyone who loves chihuahuas. But uh, it's, a, it's an urban tale in my family of how I was chased by a chihuahua, who is this small, but absolutely, absolutely deserves the title of ankle biters, because that's literally what they do. So, Agile has been domesticated. It's been 20 plus years since the Agile Manifesto was signed, about that long. And I actually went back to read Extreme Programming, for instance, and other books. And what they were talking about in those books is essentially all about complexity. How do you, how do you look at all those interactions, those individuals over processes, the customer collaboration, all of those human interactions, it is complex in nature. So I wanted to go to the next slide. And right now, we have these issues in the current state. For anyone who attended the workshop day before yesterday called The Future Backwards, we actually had different tables come up with describing the current state of Agile and then to look at the future. And the main, one of the recurring themes I saw was how do we scale Agile? And Agile is in a state of sclerosis, right? It's not as Agile as it used to be. And these are just some of the issues that we see. It's not exhaustive, and it's not just in Agile. I would say in almost any field, you can find these issues. For instance, recipe users. People see Agile as a recipe. They see Scrum as a recipe. You have a, and that leads to a certification racket. You can have 
however many letters behind your name, and people will say, okay, maybe you, you, you'd be good to hire because you have those letters over your name. But the reality is, as mentioned just now, I took a three-day course, and I can put CSM behind my name if I wanted to. But actually, I don't want to because I've never actually had the experience of being a scrum coach of a team in an organization. And this, are just, this is just a flavor of some of the issues that we are facing. And also, I debated putting the last point in because that could be slightly, the wording could be slightly contentious, but I couldn't find a better description. Religious adherence to your different, to all the different you know, flavors and strands of thinking within software development and agile. These are just some of the issues in the current state. Again, non-exhaustive, and you can find them in many other fields. This is where we are at. How I'd like to take you through this talk is to actually bring us back to basics. I've actually removed uh, the one about working software <laughs> over documentation, because I think that's fairly obvious. Uh, I wanted to focus on these three. You all remember this, don't you? Yeah? <laughs> it's the first thing they teach you in just about any course. I wanted to talk about individuals and interactions over processes and tools, but more specifically, the individuals and interactions. Anyone heard of Kinevin? The Kinevin framework? Yeah, I can see now, it's wonderful. Kinevin is a Welsh word that is apparently very difficult to translate into English. I'm not Welsh, but I spent four years in the UK, specifically Wales. It is loosely translated as the place of your multiple belongings. What that means is that our upbringing, our ancestry, where we grew up, where we went to school, where we worked, all of this contributes to our overall identity. The, anyone recognize the backdrop of the slide? Yeah, that's Singapore, isn't it? It's so shiny, great photographer managed to capture it like a mirror. However, I wanted to show you this. Same vantage point in 1960, the year my mother was born. That is her Kinevin, right? And it's also really starting to think that in 1960s, when my, when my parents were born, they were born as British subjects. Starting to think that, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not sure, I mean, probably quite a few of you here could relate to that as well, but so much has changed from there to there. But both of these are Kinevins in Singapore. The place of your multiple belongings. Where do people come from? They come to you as fully formed adults, to your teams, to your organizations. But somehow that is forgotten the moment they join. We, we, we try to fit people as cogs into a machine. But we need to take a step back and realize that all of these multiple belongings affect them and their identity and how they behave. We can't change that but we can try to understand and manage that. But the Kinevin framework, quite familiar, I think, to anyone who's uh, watched any of our videos, is a sense-making framework or a decision-making framework. I love Fred's, uh, the way he frames it as for problem analysis. I think in software dev especially, that is a perfect description of what this framework can be used for. Uh, the seminal article in 2007 in the Harvard Business Review titles, it, titles Kinevin as the, a leader's framework for decision making. And I won't spend too much time on this because I want to give you really, really practical tips and tricks for individuals and interactions over processes. On the right side, you have clear and complicated domains. Those are audit systems. That's where you have things like bookkeeping, auditing, it follows cause and effect. You sense, categorize, respond data to, to data, or you sense data, analyze it, and respond. We don't deal with that too much. On the left-hand side is where life gets really interesting. In the chaotic domain, no one really should stay there for too long because the energy cost is very high. If you think about an emergency or disaster response or fire, the main thing to do to stabilize the system is to first act in it. And then you sense all the different streams of data that's coming out, and then you respond accordingly. That is also the domain of novel practice, because things that happen are so chaotic, you may not necessarily have past experience to rely on to act in it. So humans, we really should not stay in chaotic for too long. Where most of human interactions take place is in the complex domain. I like to say that when we're outside the workplace, we don't 
interact with our family and our friends as if we were in the office. We don't have KPIs, we don't have objectives, we don't have project plans, we just live our lives and we interact with each other as human beings. Somehow that is lost the moment we step into an office. And that's quite sad. That's part of what rewilding is. We need to take a step back and remember our humanity. So in a complex domain, you probe. These are like multiple little experiments that you run in parallel, critically. You sense the data that's coming out of it, and then you respond accordingly. And let's not forget that little uh, space in the middle called aporia or confusion, where no one can decide where they're at. A lot of people are disagreeing. You can stay there, or you can choose to move into a complex space. So that's Kinevin in a nutshell. And also a fantastic visual rendering of Kinevin by Martin Berg. Just leave this here. You can look at it later. Okay. Great. I wanted to move on into customer collaboration, to highlight customer collaboration over contract negotiation, but really focusing more on collaboration and interactions. And these are three methods based on Kinevin and complex system for increasing interactions and enhancing collaborations. And this is something, by the way, we don't just teach it, we actually use it internally in our own organization, but also with clients whom we help. And all this, as you, can, as you have noticed by now, have to do with how do you interact and manage humans. The first one we have is entangled trios. Beyond pair programming, what can you do to introduce a third party to it? One thing we have done is to take a senior database or systems architect with a recent graduate from computer science and, critically, someone who's trained to talk to users, someone who understands users, which is actually quite a unicorn in my, in my experience. It's quite hard to find these people. And then you get them, get these trios. You can form four to five trios of three and then put them onto the same problem and to see what, what each trio comes up with. And you'll actually find that every single trio comes up with different takes on the same problem. Okay? And not just in programming. You can do it in organizations as well, in product, in just about anything you can think of. Uh, in a social resilience uh, project that we did in Wales, we actually did transgenerational, intergenerational trios. We got someone from an older generation, with someone from in their grandchild's generation, and someone in civil service or government, so that they could look at social problems together in a very local context, and be able to come up with a stream of solutions. So it's not just in organizations or in programming, you can apply this to society as well. Next is unarticulated needs mapping. Has anyone ever met a user who knew what they wanted? Or at least said they knew what they wanted? <laughs> I see grins, I see chuckles. Reality is, very few of us actually know what we want at any given point in time, especially if you're put on the spot in a, in a very artificial context. Understanding your needs come from daily interactions, from actually using a thing, of actually being in an environment or context. We cannot forget context. One way we do unarticulated needs mapping is actually for users to keep a journal. A daily journal, just like how you might have kept a journal or diary when growing up, about, but in this case, not about your day-to-day -day life, but their day-to-day -day interactions in the office or working on a product or across teams. Because you can't articulate what you don't know. It's not known to you yet, but as it comes to you, and if you make a note of it daily and then compare across teams, you'll be much more effective in gathering and mapping all of those unarticulated needs. And then at some point, they become not unarticulated, they actually become articulated so that you can then work on it, say, get an entangled trio to work on it. Last thing, well, the third method that we use a lot is distributed ideation and feedback. It means we need to increase the cognitive diversity of all the feedback that we're getting. So not just one group of users who are quite homogenous, but make it more heterogeneous. Look for different users with different perspectives. A very, uh, an example we like to use, now distributed ideation and feedback is not the same as crowdsourcing, for instance, although you can draw some parallels to that. Um, an example we like to use is farmers guessing the weight of a cow at a country fair. 
None of these farmers will get the correct answer, but the average of all their guesses is close, about maybe 5% off from the actual weight of a cow. And there are statistical and mathematical reasons for that. I won't go into that, but you can look it up online. It is an actual thing. What this means for us when we distribute ideation is to get a whole range of ideas from mavericks, from people who really think outside the box, rather than from, from just your standard user groups. Okay? What this does is that you can generate a lot of new ideas. You can also throw entangled trios at those ideas to start to develop and to look at different products. Okay, how do we respond to change? And Oana, you know, you, you, know, you had sessions on change. It's such, such a huge topic. I also help clients with change management and transformation. And every single time they say, you know, we have the systems. We know what we're going to implement, for instance, SAP. Actually, what we need help with is managing the people, managing everyone's thoughts and feelings and emotions that they bring to the workplace into a change management plan. That is what's really tricky for them. And what to do, we have what we call the Frozen 2 strategy for change. Has anyone watched Frozen 1, the Disney movie? Great. Frozen 2, the follow-up? Awesome, okay. So the true heroine is the one without the magic, the younger sister. And then she sings the song when she was lost in the woods. All I can do is do the next right thing because she doesn't know what to do. She's lost in the woods. I hope never to be lost in the woods. Dave Snowden has taken me on mountain treks in Wales. I survived. <laughs> but I, if I imagine myself not having a guide, not knowing what to do, that's really scary. But all I could do to survive is to do the next right thing. You really have to feel your way around. When you want to respond to change over following a plan, what you need to do is find what we call an adjacent possible. What is the next most possible thing I can do for change. And that answer is not, doesn't come to you in an hour. It comes from interactions. It comes from, to go back to the previous slide on those methods, it comes from working with entangled trios. It comes from getting distributed ideation and feedback. That is how you can start to look for the adjacent possible and do the next right thing. And it's extremely agile. You have to be to adapt to change. We have some heuristics for managing complexity. If you remember chefs versus recipe users. The first thing you can do is to optimize for granularity. So Kent Beck wrote in Extreme Programming, and I actually went and reread the book. What's the smallest possible thing that could work? How do you decompose things into the smallest possible units that are coherent, and then to recombine them? Don't repeat, not repeating them or aggregating those small things, but recombine them. It is in the recombination of these small things that you find new patterns and break the old ones. You also need to disintermediate decision making. What that means is to remove layers of interpretation and mediation from decision makers to the users and the raw data, which is usually in this case, users. And then you need to distribute cognition this is quite similar to distributed ideation. You get lots of people from different backgrounds to look at the same data in parallel without consultation. That's a very important thing, so that they can give you a whole range of perspectives, and you know that they have not talked to each other or colluded. Okay. So I wanted to recap what can rewilding do for Agile, the concept of taking us back to the roots. I read a, an article just a few days ago from, in The Guardian, and this man, now 40 years old, but as a boy in the south of England, used to do free diving in the sea. And when he was free diving as a boy, it was, the, sea was, the seabed was full of kelp, and kelp is extremely important for marine biodiversity. But now, at his age, at 40, that has mostly been dredged up from fishing trawlers. And it's really, really sad because it means that the sea is no longer as healthy as it used to be, and marine life is no longer as healthy as it used to be. And what he has been doing in his garage on his own time, and he's just an NHS technician, so he's not really very rich, 
He is trying to breed algae so that he can go plant them in the seabed during winter. Free diving from the shore in winter, that, that is to be applauded. What he's doing is to rewild the seabed so that he can restore balance to the ecosystem. Okay? So what this means for Agile is that we, we need to restore these ecosystems to the point where they can take care of themselves. We need to reconnect with who or what matters that means with each other and with our stories. It also represents hope for the future of Agile. I'm not going to stand here and say that we know what the solution to scaling Agile is. I mean, we have SAFE and we have other frameworks for that. What it means that is that if we can start, to go back to the previous slide, if we can start to look at the granularity of Agile, break things down to the lowest possible coherent unit, how can we recombine that? How can we look at new ways of scaling? How can we get more in touch with raw data, with user stories, so that we can make better decisions faster? How can we get more diverse perspectives so that we don't fall into groupthink? All of these heuristics. All of that can help us rewild Agile. And that's the end. It's 30 minutes, I kept it quite brief because I wanted to leave some time, about 15 minutes or so, for questions because I know that that's quite a bit of material and I think that <laughs> you might have quite a few questions, so I wanted to leave this time open for that. Okay. Any questions? Thoughts? Comments? Thank you, Jules, for the uh, great presentation. Um, when you speak about the three heuristics, I can understand the dis um, this uh, what is the uh, disintermediate uh, decision making i can imagine that can you give some examples of distributed cognition and uh, optimizing for granularity that way i understand if what you are saying is what uh, i could i should interpret absolutely uh, i'll start with this intermediating decision making this comes with a health warning because you are playing with power dynamics and we have to accept that power dynamics is part of life, part of organizational, uh, yeah, just part of organizations, but not an agile example, which I think hopefully I will make the point better, is that we were working on a project uh, with Singapore government, and we were looking at social resilience. We were looking at how can we strengthen the fabric of the nation. I think every government is interested in that. But there are so many diverse perspectives we're all voters, we're all citizens, we all have a say. How can we manage all of that? How can we get decision makers, in this case the policy makers, in touch with the stories that people are actually telling each other and sharing on the street? This is what we mean by this intermediation. intermediation the mediation usually happens when people write policy papers, when they put forward and lobby what you know a pet project that they want. But if leaders, if decision makers are able to interact directly with the people that they are serving or the people that we're building products for, that is how we can make better decisions faster. And just a caveat, we're not saying that mediation doesn't have its place. Middle management exists for a very good reason. They are the engine that drives things forward. But in many cases, there is a lot of bottlenecks and also people start to develop their own pet projects and their own behaviors and that can really start to constrain what a decision maker or leader sees. So if a leader wants to disrupt patterns and find out what's really going on, go straight to the raw data. Go talk to some users. Go talk to some citizens. That's an example of disintermediating decision making. And as I said, not just in Agile, across organizations, anywhere in life, I would say. Um, for distributing cognition, um, again, to give another non-Agile example, in an organization, how do we find those mavericks? How can we find those bright sparks, the people that always think out of the box? In many cases, in most organizations, they have to hide themselves. If they want promotions, if they want to move through the ranks, they, you very quickly find out that if you stand out like a sore thumb, you can be very, very easily smacked down again. But we need those people. These are the people with all the ideas that will help us look at things in a different way. How can you find them? Right, what, what, how can you create conditions that feel safe for these people to make their views known? And not just to give 
an entire platform just to these pe this group of people, but also to let, to let them surface naturally in the entire environment. That's what distributing the cognition means. Uh, and for optimizing for granularity. Um, so this is something we do internally quite a bit with all the different methods that we have. You had a taste of future backwards. We have knowledge mapping and uh, decision mapping as other of our methods. And we have a knowledge management method called ASHEN. Well, it's an, actually an acronym. It stands for artifacts, skills, heuristics, experience, and natural talent put together ashen. And these five things represent what is naturally available in an organization. What are the artifacts, like written documents, archives? What are the skills that you have in your workforce? What are the heuristics that you have developed in your organization over time? What is the experience levels of different people? And what are the nat natural talents that are emerging? If you look at all of those and you break those down into their lowest coherent unit, you can start to combine and say, ah, okay, we have actually quite a high level of natural talent, but they don't really have enough experience. What can we do to raise that experience? Or we have a lot of artifacts. We have tons of storage of all these archives, okay? And maybe I think what we're lacking is experience. So how can you break those things down into the lowest coherent unit? and then recombine. So that is an example of granularity. I hope to answer your question. Is the gentleman there? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about managing complexity. Uh, I've, I, at least I'm getting this initial sense that uh, for some of these things, you'd need a lot of uh, at least a lot of people doing a lot of things mm -hmm. simultaneously to or generating a lot of data so that you can have better decision making. Mm -hmm. um, what would you suggest for say a smallish team of say 10 people, mm -hmm. um, three technologists, two product people? I mean at, at those small numbers you don't really have, like, you only have so many people with so much background. How do you try and implement some of this with a small team? Good question. We do work with small teams and then groups of small teams. Um, interestingly, I actually think that sometimes the smaller the group, the more complexity there is. <laughs> yes. It's sometimes easy, uh, and you know, this is just my personal opinion, it's sometimes easier to look at a larger system and be able to d detect patterns of what's happening right. than for a, very, a smaller team where everyone knows everyone. That has its own layer of complexity, which yeah. I'll be just be very frank, no one has cracked a code for that. Okay. <laughs> no, but, oh, no. but there are ways to manage it. Because in complexity, we make the argument that it's more important to manage and influence the interactions between human beings than to try to change or manage the human beings themselves. This goes back to Kenevin, uh, the place of our multiple belongings. We really cannot hope to change people fundamentally for who they are. And at some level, we have to accept that that is what it is. Mm -hmm. However, we can change the environment in which they interact. We can change the way they interact, how often, or maybe they need way more interaction. Also, allowing them to, uh, well, not allowing, but encouraging them to keep those daily journals of their frustrations. You know, for instance, a tester's journal will look very different from a product manager's journal. However, they are all looking at the same problem or the same system or the same product that they're working on. Looking at all those diverse perspectives, but without them talking to each other, which is what keeping a journal is about, allows you then, let's say, if you are the, you know, the scrum master or a coach, to then look at, this, look at this, the, the system of that team as a whole to be, to be able to understand what you should do next. That is the next possible thing you could do. Understood. And Obviously, you'd have to build an environment in which they'd feel comfortable sharing the journal with you without fear of uh, absolutely, absolutely retribution or something. Yes, yeah. fear of rec fear of recrimination, uh, fear of standing out is definitely a huge problem, which is why we recommend keeping anonymous journals. However, of course, in a small team, <laughs> you would know who they are. But that is less important than people feeling comfortable journaling their you know their daily experiences. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for your amazing presentation. I just have one question about, you know, encouraging 
increasing interactions and enha enhancing collaboration, the first thing that you spoke about is tryouts, or trios, try you know, entangles, entangled trios. How critical is having that entangles trios, uh, trios in, in, in building that uh, interaction? Speak, uh, speaking about <coughs> a bit. Yeah, Sorry. Soft. Yeah. So, how do you go about creating these trios, number one? Mm -hmm. And uh, you also mentioned about uh, divers. Diverse uh, trios. How how important is to how how do you you know build this diversity in building these trios? Okay. And uh, what is your experience experimenting with it, and what's the result that you got out of uh, building these trios? Okay. Great question. Um, the rule of thumb, the heuristic for creating trios, is that they cannot come from the same background. Each of the three people cannot come from the same background. So you cannot have three system architects in a trio. You cannot have three testers in a trio. They have to come from different backgrounds. In this case, I'm using an organizational or software development uh, <clears throat> example. I gave the example in uh, that government project we ran in Wales where we had someone from an older generation, someone from a much younger, uh, two, at least two generations down, and then a civil servant. Okay? So it really has to be different because what we need is those different perspectives to work on the same problem. So in in programming, it would be, as mentioned, a systems architect, but much more experienced, someone who has essentially decades under their belt with a recent graduate from computer science and then a user who is not a techie. It has to be from three different backgrounds for an entangled trio to work. I hope that was clear. And your second question was about the ideation, was that correct? Also oh, trio? It's about building the diversity in the trio. Oh, and, uh, building you know, diversity, yes. You made the statement that if somebody who's more experienced can influence the lesser experienced person, somebody who's just fresh. Yes. His point of view can be completely influenced by the person with a lot of experience and, you know, maybe some, you know, authority in, in, a, in a specific topic. So how do you balance the right. different perspectives in a trio to make sure that it is not biased with the most right. powerful person in the trio? Good question. You can never uh, predict <laughs> or plan for it. What you need to do is to monitor it. Because okay. you can't predict how three people will interact when you put them together. You, you have a rough idea, let's say if you already broadly know them and their backgrounds. You have a rough idea of how they, their personalities may or may not clash. That's a very important thing to look at. But you have to just start by putting three people together and seeing how it goes. And if it really proves to be a problem, then you may have to disrupt that and change the trio a bit. But if you have some faith in people and let them work out their problems, it generally works out. Because also they are from three very different backgrounds. Yep. Okay, thank you. Do you have some examples in Agile of teams that have been rewilded successfully at this point? Sorry, could you repeat that? Do you have some examples of teams that have rewilded Agile successfully at this point? Not quite. This brand, <laughs> the rewilding brand that we came up with is about a year and a half old. So we're still working on it in terms of <coughs> examples, but I'll definitely report back. I will say for Entangled Trios, we are, work, we are using it on ourselves within our organization. So for instance, we have a marketing trio. We take three people from different backgrounds. Right? Someone, you know, one, of, one of the team is from finance and admin, and you say, well, what, what does that have to do with marketing? No we actually are putting them together so that they can give us their, their perspectives from a finance point of view about how marketing could be done or done better. Same with product trios, et cetera, within our organization. Uh, hi. hi, my name is Sohani. And uh, my question is, uh, th there definitely is a cost associated with rewi rewilding Agile um, in the form of maybe cost, time, uh, skill building. Mm -hmm. um, I want to understand your thoughts or perspective on how do we manage those risks. Very, very good question. We are in an age of budget constraints and expect, we are expected to do more things with less money or resources. Uh, unfortunately, not just in Agile, but everywhere else. I would say that yes, the outlay appears to be higher than, say, sending someone on a three-day course. However, nothing sustainable ever comes that easily or perceived to be that cheap. 
And, but if we want to rewild Agile and to start to, and to remember where it came from, then it's an outlay that we have to take on. I mean, th there, is the concept of, there is the concept of sacrifice. Some sacrifices have to be made. And to use the example of recipe users and chefs, I don't consider myself a chef. I consider myself, sorry, a little more than a recipe user, however, and that's because, I'm so sorry, keep skipping, but there was that slide about recipe users and chefs, because my mother trained me how to cook, but she didn't start me off with standing in front of a wok. Also, an eight-year-old, nine-year-old should not stand in front of a hot Chinese wok. I started off by doing prep, right? Shelling prawns, I still hate shelling prawns to this day. But I had to start from there. I had to understand the basics of food preparation. I had to understand ingredients. I had to understand all these building blocks of cooking before I was considered competent to first of all use her knife <laughs> and to use that beloved wok. That, and that, 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 the cost associated with that, that training apprenticeship model is not cheap. It's the development of a human being. But this is also, this also you know, harks back to how nowadays humans and organizations are mostly treated as cogs in a machine because it's seen as being more cost efficient. But actually, what is the true cost of that? We have to stop and think. Are we developing humans to be who they could be if they became chefs and not just recipe users? Because a good scrum master doesn't just take a, a good scrum master, if you see them, isn't someone who's taken the three-day course and then suddenly they know exactly what to do. You have to earn those stripes. You have to be in the thick of it. You have to be working with your teams. And that is not easy. That is really not easy. But there's no other way to rewild Edge on to take us back to our roots without that, without that cost. And that's my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We're just about at 45 minutes, I think, yes. Any questions? Thoughts, comments, feedback? <laughs> I, I, I was really tickled when Naresh said, I think yesterday, or no, maybe on the first day, in the opening remarks, um, go hard on the first time speakers. I was like, oh no, ah. <laughs> no, you've been quite gentle so far. Um, hi, uh, a good topic and a very different way of doing the things. Uh, so, so far you said that there are no uh, case study as, as such that you have uh, because it's still in progress. But you have Sorry, you no, no history of what? Uh, the rewilding of Agile mm -hmm. yet. Uh, but have you seen any anti pattern so far uh, of what, are, what all things that you have implemented? You mean uh, at least, let's say, for diverse trios? Mm -hmm. uh, Combining three people together, like, are there any anti patterns? Anti, sorry. Anti patterns. Anti patterns. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I love this question. Anti patterns. Huh. Actually, no. I would say that patterns are being broken. Is that what you mean by anti pattern? Yeah. So some somebody said that, like, um, uh, among three. Uh, somebody could be senior and then yes. they can dominate that. That could mm -hmm. be one. Uh, something similar, um, like we know for pair programming, again, the senior developer and the junior yes. developer, that, yeah. that can happen. Mm -hmm. Now we are including one more person here. Uh, so, of course, the complexity increases, uh, but then some, somewhere similar on the similar lines, have you seen uh, things breaking more rather than, you know, building uh, effectively? I think so far I've only seen one example of a trio not working out, but that was also because there were already long-standing personality issues to begin with. And it was very difficult in hindsight to see how that trio could ever have worked in the first place. So that is why I say you need to be very conscious of the personalities of any histories before you start to put trios together. However, you can depersonalize a trio because you're getting people together to work on a problem or a product. So hopefully it becomes less about the personality clashes or tensions than it is about working together towards a common goal. Would you say that uh, a driver's trio is basically a parenting 
parenting? Yeah, <laughs> because you yourself yeah. said that <laughs> your mother actually uh, taught ah, you and then... Ah. Oh, well, that's more recipe users and chefs. That is the apprenticeship model. Uh, hopefully not parenting <laughs> uh, at, at this stage in people's uh, you know, adult lives. It's more about mentorship and guidance. Uh, for recipe, uh, recipe users versus chefs. However, for trios, no, actually. There's very, very light monitoring of what goes on. The proof is in the pudding, as the English saying goes. What, they what the trios come up with will be the proof of how it's working. Yeah. One final question? Okay. One more. Okay, one more question. We have four minutes. Oh, we have four minutes. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so, I really like the Frozen 2 strategy, uh, but can you give a few examples, uh, like in your work outside software, like how do you go about identifying the next right thing to do? Mm -hmm. And then a, a story, a short story on that would be nice. Okay. How to identify the next right thing to do? Let me just get that slide. Great. So, the image that you see is actually from data, a data set from our SenseMaker software. So I think I've mentioned before that at the Kinevin company, all of our workshop methods uh, and ideas are open source on our wiki. So you can, for instance, take Future Backwards and run it on your own teams. However, we do uh, develop our own proprietary software, so we know a little bit about software development. And the dots that you are seeing are actually stories that people have shared. Okay, we have, we have uh, anonymized uh, the entire data set and you won't see any data behind it anyway. Uh, you won't see any stories behind it anyway, but each dot represents a story and the, the color gradients are actually where the clusters are forming, right? And all of this is based on the way that people index or tag their own stories. That then gives us the calculations for how we can put it on an X, Y axis, for instance. So, I don't think this points. But if you look here, there's a cluster, and we can say, okay, what is actually our ideal state? Whatever your X, Y axis is, for instance, time for, of delivery versus cost of delivery. So if you imagine that's your X, Y axis, on the top right, that's not a good place to be where you have a lot of time and a lot of cost associated with delivery. This would be the most ideal, wouldn't it? But we're never here. <laughs> You can, you know, and really depending on your organization, you have to decide, okay, where is our ideal state for cost and time of delivery? So maybe somewhere in the middle, some put it there. But okay, what we can see from the stories that people are telling is that they feel that we are set somewhere around here. But that's too far towards a lot of time and a lot of cost of delivery. Ideally, we should be here but that's too far to go from there. So what's the next right thing we can do to shift the pattern so that more stories are being told and shifted here? And again, you can see it's very, very contextual. You have to actually look at the stories that people are telling, do more interviews to, to understand, okay, so let's run those multiple experiments and see if after three months or even two months, if the stories start to shift to our ideal state here. This is what we mean by looking for the next right thing, finding that adjacent possible and doing the next right thing. Here, we may never achieve it and we have to be okay with that, but here is more achievable. So what can we do to shift more stories, not just from you know, internal users, sorry, from, from internally and from users, but also from customers. 